Hi everyone, welcome to Jansen Art Studio. I'm David, of course, and Jessica's over here, and hello. Martha's over here. Everyone hello, say hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. hello, hello. They're manning the computers, so when you have questions and stuff like that that you want to see, just like we've done before in other live classes, you have questions, you just fire them away, and uh, we'll see if we're going to ask them. We're going to run a real casual, relaxed. We haven't run a live class here this year just because we've been so busy out there at the Sydney Fine Arts Center. So now that we're back here in the classroom in Elizabethtown, we can uh, have some fun, have some live classes. And uh, Jessica and I have a bunch of live classes and fun things all set up for uh, what's coming up here, after, the, especially after the holidays. We'll all be a little bit busy for the holidays, but afterwards, what do you say, Jay? Sounds great to me. Yeah, we're gonna, so we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna get going uh, with all of that. But anyway, what I, one of the main topics that I wanted to talk with you about tonight is uh, the, the blending with acrylics. And it's something that Mary brought up before and James brought up before. And last week I filmed, uh, and when you're in the classroom, on the, on the menu on the left side, after you log in, there'll be a, a, down at the bottom there, there'll be a thing called answer or video answers, I think is what I titled that. And I filmed a long one there about the answers that, that Mary had asked and um, James had asked about the drying times of acrylics. And I was gonna do some other things and stuff tonight too, along with you. We're gonna do all kinds of stuff and let you ask some questions and get you going. But it seems to me that there is a, uh, I wouldn't say an overwhelming desire to paint wet into wet. Everyone thinks that you have to blend. And I very, very seldom blend. I mean, we make global colors. And I, to a certain extent, I think that that was a problem for a while because the global colors, we called it oil emulation, you know, em emulating the longer time, drawing time of oils. And that created some problems, making people think that you, the only way that you can really paint is if it's wet. And the funny thing is, you know, we get all kinds of questions into the studio through the phone and everything. And this evening, Martha answered the phone, and he was a portrait painter. A, a man, I was on the West Coast or something yep, like that? Yep, in California. Out in California. And he's a portrait painter, and he uses our acrylics for the underpainting and his oils on top after that to finish off his portraits. And he wanted to know if we knew a way to make oils dry slower. And we were like, why do you need oils to dry slower? Because he wants to be able to come back a week to, you know, or so later and still be able to work into it. Now, that to me is like a, a big concern because I painted in oils for 10 years. And, you know, I, I never went back into anything and reworked it or I never thought I had to go back into something while it was wet um, and so I want to show you some of the techniques some of the things and it's reinforced in that video video answers and as I do some of this stuff you're gonna have some questions and if you have questions you just fire away with that there'll be a little bit of a delay because we have about a 15 or 20 second delay probably yeah. tonight don't you say Dave? yeah they're about yeah they're about there's about 15 20 seconds so what i'm doing here and they're over there listening to it and talking to your answers and stuff like that there's about a 15 20 second delay on the broadcast that that they receive so i'm a little ahead of you guys but uh, so they have to they have to adjust because they hear it in one ear and they hear it on another thing on one side over there. Jessica's got headphones on here listening to YouTube, ear open here listening to me. So <laughs> and your brain's got to decipher all this, doesn't it? No problem. We can do. We we're can flexible. Do. Yeah, yeah, we're flexible. Right. We can do this. So and you're picking up the volume, everything. OK. Yeah. Right? Yep. I so hear, I I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, so we were t running some tests. This is the first time we've opened the classroom up all this year. We're like, okay, this is how we did it. Okay, we remember this, <laughs> you know. So anyway, so I'm going to show you guys some uh, some fun stuff. We're going to do some some painting here. I'm going to show you some wet into wet, and we're going to answer some of your questions. And again, as you as we go along, you have a question about something, you fire away. And even if it comes to you later on, you fire because we're going to do a lot of these live classes back here again now that everyone's painted through some of the lessons and you're, you've got some questions and you've got some, some stuff that you're going to talk. And I'll switch over here to the downshot to uh, my painting here. And um, 
what I have here. This is just pure acrylics. I just put out the, I just used my tube colors here like this, and I just squirted it out. This is how I've been doing a lot of the, the uh, move my mouse and stuff out of the way. Actually, it's Jessica's computer here, so I'll get paint all over it. So. <laughs> we got paint all over everything we here. We got paint over everything here. One of the things I did in that video answers video, um, and it was a question that, um, uh, came in from James and Jeff I know you're online here tonight too and you've got a lot of questions so you can start asking some of those too and great and Jeff has written me all kinds of, of, of really nice um, I go back to this so Jeff has written me all kinds of really nice things about his painting how it's improving and uh, how his wife now wants him to frame his paintings and stuff now so it is asking about that so I love hearing from you guys with that with that kind of stuff it just it makes my day and and uh, it makes it fun to do all this. But anyway, so I have my acrylics out here. Now, one of the things I did in that answer video that was that I really liked was uh, James had, had asked the question that if you are you're painting, the paint was just drying up too fast for him. And so here's just a regular right out of the tube acrylics. And I'm just going to put this down. And I, I, I'm going to put this down with a nice thick coat coating of it right here. Now. What James asked was was a logical, very logical question. He said, if I want, you know, my paint's drying too fast, do I add more water to it? So if I add water to this paint over here and thin this out, and then we put this on over here, we put a coat of this on over here like this, let's put some of that on with the water, will that slow it down? No, in actuality, what that'll do is that'll make it dry faster, okay? In the paint, Inside the paint, inside a tube of paint like this, you have water. There's a, a little bit of thing we call our secret sauce. There's there's glycols, and the glycols are what dry really, really slow. Water is what dries really, really fast. You increase the glycol, which is like what is in extender, your extender medium. You go increasing this into your paints and you increase the drying time, or you slow down, let me say, the, the drying time, so it takes longer to dry. But inside that paint, why we make it an acrylic is we want it to dry, you know, fast, faster. And the water is in there. Now we balance that when we make an acrylic, when a paint company makes an acrylic, we balance that, how much water to how much glycol that we put in there. Because we can make a tube of acrylic paint that doesn't dry for five, six hours. That's easy to do. We reduce the water, increase the glycol, coach the cost goes up because glycol is really expensive. Um, but that's what they do. that's what you do. But if you increase the water in your paint, you're increasing the faster drying component of the paint because the water dries fast. And so, and you uh, you can see that. Just put out a drop of water onto onto your uh, onto your palette. Just take your palette, put out a drop of water onto your palette. Put out a drop of extender the water will dry long 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 let's just do that here too because that's we'll be here for a little bit we'll put a drop of water right there onto the palette and then we'll just put a little drop of of extender out here too smear it out a bit put that out onto the palette the water will dry long long before the um the uh, extender one does now also right here up over to this um side up here i have well, I thought I'd grab that. Hey, Jay, up in the, in this filming studio is a big jar of global white. Okay. Up, up to the side there. I thought I brought that, but I didn't do that. But if we look up over here, this is pretty much it's getting dry. It's getting really dry, where this is really wet still. So when you put the more paint on, it's going to dry it's going to dry a lot slower. Now we add we add extenders and, and glycols to it. They dry really slow. Now here where that water is, you can see where the water is soaking in and drying up quite a bit and the extender is not. And so that's grow, that's growing really, really fast. Just global business. Extenders? No. Oh, oh. no. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, I have it right here. <laughs> Hey, I grabbed two of them. I, I, I did. I grabbed two of them by mistake. This is my this is my big paint. Yeah, Mar. Your picture is looking a little bit. Um, you don't have sharp. Oh, there it is. It's back now. Yeah. Clarity. Yeah, that's uh, oh, that's, that's you too. That's that, you. That's no. me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, what do I do? But this is what um, this is the global white here. Okay, and I'll take it. that uh, as I and I take this 
and I'll put this out up to here and we'll just put a, a coat of it out here with that as well. And I do this on the video and we, as I paint some flowers, we just watch that thing, watch the colors. We watch paint dry. It's a lot of fun. And you'll, you'll find that when you add the water, it dries fast. When you add, or when you put the paint out thicker, it dries a lot slower. When you put the paint on really thick, it dries um, really, really slow when, when you put it out with that extender in it. Now, one of the things that um, I'm going to be, well, I'm, I'm going to be putting up in into the YouTube channel, onto the Art Videos Direct, is uh, this particular painting, okay? This one right here. Let me put this up here. This painting, I just filmed this uh, last night, and uh, it's a really fun, fun technique, and it's one of the classes we will be um, we'll be working on here this this upcoming year. It's not scheduled. It's not on the schedule right now. But I use some really great tools. And some of you that were out in um, in Sydney earlier this year, after uh, after the Heritage Week was over, the some of the Asians stayed over for an extra week, and we freaked them out by making them paint with these. And it was <laughs> it was amazing but you will see me paint this is this is the one this is one of my favorite ones there's the mountains and here's the ocean color right there and so there's the ocean and there's the mountains and uh, this is what I use this and my brush to paint this painting and I put the paint on here I just slide the paint on here like that just really really thick and uh, I mean it is on here really really thick and it takes me about an hour and 15 minutes to paint this painting uh, on, in video. You'll watch the whole thing, how I do everything. But it looks like there's all this swirling color that goes all in through here. I did not use a single drop of uh, extender. I used only the acrylic paint and the thickness of the paint to make the paint dry slower. So, and you'll see me in the video when I want to put rocks in here after I put on this this streak of white foam you'll see me have to wait for that to tack up so I can get some some rocks and stuff in there so what what the bottom line to to a lot of this is is thick paint and you know this one this one that's right back there as you can see right back there that's another one that I did with the same um, with the same scraper the big scraper just like this I used the scraper on those I used to paint global with those and now I get these beautiful effects just by using more paint. So the, the real bottom line is the more paint you have, the slower the dry pile. So if you're working on an area and after 10 minutes it's starting to dry, you're not using enough paint. Does that make sense? You're not using enough paint. And I'll be, sh I'll be showing you uh, some of that. But those are some things that I want to do. So the whole thing is... That is, is, you know, if you really want it to stay wet, more paint. If you want it to really, really stay wet for hours, more paint with extender in it. And that's what it does. So, so like here, the water is completely dried up over here, but the extender is still here. And this one is still wet. It, this is still wet. The global is really wet. This is completely, totally dry over here wherever I added water to it because that's a faster drying element. So we'll set this over to the side here. And we'll paint and we'll and we'll start painting something and I'll start painting uh, you know we'll paint some flowers and um, we'll paint some flowers and we'll uh, have a little bit of fun with with some of this so I guess I didn't show that on camera there when I did that because I didn't switch it over but this one is still wet see how that one is still wet that one is really really wet this is the extender this is thick paint and this is where the water was it's just dry and that's um, that's uh, where the extender was the water that was right here is completely dry but the extender is still wet so extenders your slow drying stuff that's that's my point is but you don't have to have that you can have just paint so let's let's go in here and let's paint and I'm gonna paint a couple of things matter of fact let me just start out like a little rose here and I'll let it completely dry so we'll take a little white here and make a beautiful rose here I don't want to touch this that had some extender in it that will not work for me tonight this is how I like to paint I like to shear 
We talked about this in the S105. You shear off the edges. That lot makes it easier for me to paint more transparent petals later on. I like to shear off the edges like that. I don't worry about any of this stuff out here because that's easy to correct and cover up and everything. I'm going to take, in the S105, we talk about painting values, up and down the value scale. So if I'm right here, if I wanted to, to really paint a beautiful rose, I would work within values of two, up and down. Then I don't have to do that much blending. But I'm going to do something really, really harsh here to show you how you fix it. Let's put a dark in here like this. Let's screw this rose up a bit, okay? And we'll put in just pure acrylic. I'm just gonna set that in there like that. There's my bottom bowl here. I'm gonna set that in there like that so that's a little bit light and dark too fast. And it's a mistake, but we'll turn it into a thousand dollar painting in just a moment, okay? I like that plan. <laughs> Martha, Martha likes those plans. So come on over here. Let's work through some, let's work through a rose. Let's just take a white, let's do a, let's start painting here. Dee says it's already an awesome painting. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear that, Dee. <laughs> so we'll start now. Now normally when then I'll shear off the edges here. Because the shear, what I do is I shear off like this. See how the paint doesn't pull a hole? It just pushes and moves like this. That's called the shear. And that's one of the things that we uh, designed the Heritage to do, was to shear over the, over the background. And of course, if I add a little sealer or something to it, the shear would be a little different because the sealer um, grabs onto stuff a little bit more. Now, let's go back. We'll let that one dry over there. But let's go back and let's make the same problem into this rose here this time here because Dee liked this she thought it was a gorgeous rose so we'll give her a gorgeous rose okay and I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom the camera in just a little bit more so I look absolutely amazing right Jay that's right Dad. yeah so one of the things is here now I've got a lot of paint here so this is still wet now even if it's here I can push this to start to soften it like this but I have to work really, really hard because my values are too far apart, see? And so that's where we created the, term, the technique of half toning, okay? So when I push this, I create actually, you know, if this is a value two, which it is, red-violet is a value two, this is value 10, of course, it's white. So by pushing it, I have to create the, the threes, the fours, the fives, the six, the sevens, the eights, the nines, and that's a lot of work to have to, to do that. So when you're having a feeling, really, that you need to blend something, and this is what I tell everybody, and it's like after Martha got off the phone this afternoon with somebody, and she said, that with, with that gentleman in California, and she said, he said he wants to work back into it again, and I said he's using the wrong colors, the wrong values. When you're having the feeling that you have to go back in and work something, you're using the wrong values. Does that make sense? Yeah, did you have some? Uh, questions from D. Yes, of so, course there is. <laughs> <laughs> so are your backgrounds thick or thin using acrylic? Uh, well, that yeah, exactly. Well, that's a really good question. Because if the background is really, really thin here, it's going to dry really fast, see? Gives me no time to push. But out here where my background is still thick, where this color is really thick, that's still wet, <laughs> see? That's still wet. So... Do I make it thin or do I make it thick? I, I started out, let me say, put it this way. I started out painting more thin because I came from decorative painting and we painted with our colors really thin so they flowed and we did strokes and we did everything. So every time I painted on my palette, I was used to working with really thin color. If you're coming from bottled acrylics, uh, you know, craft paint lines and stuff, they're made thinner. They're made with more water. And so you're used to that feel in your brush. So you you take heritage to that, mix in some water, do some stuff, make it, put it on more transparent and it dries faster and you get frustrated with it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. There's more. There's more, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Second part of our question. To get more coverage, do you use more paint and move it or add yeah. water, bigger brush or yeah. lots of paint? How well, you, you can do, coverage? you you can do any of that. Okay, so let's just say here. Now, as I'm talking here, this is starting to see where it's thicker, it's still wet. 
Here where it's thinner, it's completely dry. See? That's the main difference. Now if I and you know, and, and one of the things that James asked was, you know, do I come or excuse me, it was Mary, I think, was asking that. Do I come back in? Do I wet this area or how do I work something like that? I do. If I have to stop and come back and work on this rose again, I will strike a dark, maybe even make it darker than it is like that. Now, can you push it in and out? No. You can't because there's no white to help soften it. If I really want to do that, I mean, you can take your white out here and push this into the white here and then spend all day doing this, pushing that around to get the light colors and make yourself a beautiful blended rose. As long as you have enough color. Does that make sense? Yes. If I don't have enough paint, I pull a hole in it immediately and I don't get this beautiful working of the color here. Now this is something that took me a long time to break the habit of of painting thin, and D you and D knows that because we did that out in Sydney earlier this year, when we were switching from painting global all the years painting global to switching over to acrylics. You really had to get a lot thicker paint than you think that you're using, and that was the thing. So. You know, this white up here is still going to be wet. I know it's still going to be wet. See, it's still wet. I can still push that and soften that down. I can come in here and pick up another big old dollop of white, strike it right there onto that rose. And and it's thick, people. It's thick. It's on there thick. You can see this, the textures in there. That's what makes a beautiful painting. Now, I can push that. You just saw me do that because this red is still wet. I can push that and soften this edge here. What I like to do now is I like to say, okay, here's my 10. This is up about a value four. And so what I'll do is come up with a half tone here instead. I'll come up with a tone that is going to be a little bit darker than the white. And that's where I like to strike it. That's my next strike. And then I like to go a little bit darker yet and strike that. Now this starts to add more life to the, to the flower than just pushing it, which tends to smooth it all out and it gets one color. Does that make sense? So I like to have, I like to take my, I, when I paint now, of course I shear and that's what we do in the S105, but also in the S105, I show you a lot and boy, once you get that red violet in your brush, it is, it's a, hard to get it out and I try not to rinse my brush too much because what do I add when I rinse my brush? Water. I heard all your answers. <laughs> <laughs> water. Water. And so that's the only thing I miss about a live class, guys. Is, where's the yes, David? They all better be saying yes, David. Oh, and clapping too. They got to no. clap. Oh, yes. The chat is full of yes, so, David. <laughs> here I put that. So this is how I love to paint. I strike it. You know, I'll look I'll look and I'll strike my shadows and many times I tell you guys restate work your shadows again restate work your shadows now I so here's my shadow area here's my light area and I start working tones that are going to be you know in between here and this is where this is the way I like to paint stroking slightly different ways different angles leaving some of that out so I get more more stroke movements within the flower here see more movements, more strokes, more stuff going on. I get more interest into the flower. If I want to soften something out here, I'll take some of this color here and I'll put on a softening tone out here and soften. Now I can push it and shear it and soften it that way. Soften it right into that shadow. And there's this shadow is still wet because it's so thick. So I can still, I can half tone and then push just a little bit to shear it. You got lots of time because I have lots of paint. Does that make sense? I hear the yeses. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the, the the screen's filling up with yeses. It's oh. amazing. Is it? <laughs> and so, uh, I'll come back out here. Now this is where, if I say I'm going to push a, a petal out here, I'll take a little bit of thicker color. Sometimes you'll see me lay the brush down and strike it like this. Now what that's doing is putting on a heavy dose of paint. And then I'll take a half tone and push that in and out like this to, to soften out some of that color, some of that movement there like that. But I'm not gonna sit there and go ee, 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 and blend it. 
I want to I want to pull some of that movement here or I'll push the edge like this and I want that movement in and out of the pedal that's what I want that to do I want it to have movement in and out of the pedal here so I'll take another little acrylic here and I'll push it down and usually when I come out over here I I like to go a little cooler onto the cool side here and I'm just gonna work this in and out what I do when I paint when I, I paint a lot of you know these types of roses if I want to, if I want to get rid of that texture I just do this and that'll allow me to to negative paint and half tone later on as well it gives me more of a sheer petal what I what I paint for first when I set up a rose is I don't always just put in petals I start to I'm painting the movement I want to paint the movement of the flower the petals go in and out so you can shear that in and out like that the petals will go in and out and we can bring that bowl around. This front edge stripe that we did a few minutes ago is still wet. See, it's still wet there. The red on the inside is still wet. I had no extender in it. I just have paint. And I can restate that. And I can restate, if I want, I can restate a half tone and pull that down there too and get some of that movement in it. In a lot of my roses, when you see that, that's exactly what I'm doing is the half tones in there. Sometimes I'd say, okay, this rose is overall too cool. Maybe I'll take a little bit of my warmer yellows. Let's lighten it up just a bit. And let's just splash some yellow over here for giggles here. Let's splash in some yellow. And this is what I do. I'll, I'll restate the yellow following some of the movement. I'll restate some of my, my shadow back down here. Push some of that in. You can push it around. You can half tone it. I do both. I, I generally do both on the rows, so I get different types of looks. Sometimes I like this. Sometimes I'll leave that. I just don't want a ring of red-violet all the way around that. And because we did that a number of years ago, and I, I painted like that a number of years ago, and then I realized they don't roses don't have just a solid ring around them. We want a little warm color coming into that. That's where I like that to come in. Now that all looks blended and everything there, but it's not blended. It's just that way because I have a lot of paint. And if I wanna, if I wanna soften this back edge back here, what you do is you don't have to blend that off. You just have to create a color between here and here. And if you do it with just value, you're closer, you're better. But if I put a little bit of the yellow, which there's yellow into this background, and I put a little bit of that into this color and I drag that over the edge, I optically soften the back of that rose. Do you see? And I can drop a little bit of light over here, so let's say, push that in. If I want to restate some of the dark. Now up here, this, this red's already dark, I mean, already dry up there. So I just go to a different area, drag some of that red in. I drag some of this red in and while that's there, I can push it, shear it off. If if it dries or if it's dry and you can't shear it off, just come in there, pick up a little bit of a half tone, drag it over and push it for a minute, and you get just beautiful looks to the rose. You you don't want this smooth, smooth blending that I have there. It's just a little too too smooth here. We'll just drop a little bit of that. So are in. you just working with more, more model paint. modeled colors? You're just yeah. working the colors. Yeah. Not melding, because melding involves extender, yeah. right? Right, not, not not blending it or melting it together. I could, you know. Um, you know, it's one of the things, one of the techniques that we really haven't done too much with is you rinse your brush out really well. And if you go over this with water, you can blend it again, see? That's one thing Heritage is designed to do. You can blend that again, make that, make that absolutely smooth and boring, just like that by and that's what that's what it's made to do it's it's made to do that it's made and i usually don't show that too much because right now because one very important reason because people most most artists most acrylic painters paint too thin and they immediately pick it up all the way to the background and pull a hole mm -hmm. if they put any kind of water in it whatsoever because and this is the water is a solvent and because the water is the solvent of the painting of, of the paint but if I have if I have enough paint built up down there I can take some of this water here I'll just take a little bit here in my brush 
here and drive this over this area like this and blend that all out just like that and blend that absolutely all one color smooth boring just like that can you talk a little bit about the pressure that you're using with the variation absolutely flawless pressure <laughs> <laughs> i and this is what the fusion brushes are designed to do they're watercolor brushes okay they're watercolor brushes. Watercolor brushes uh, have a very, very soft hair. So you just want to just basically lay the pressure of the brush down. That's all you want to do. You can't attack it with a heavy hand, okay? But uh, you want to lay the pressure down. But see, that's all smooth. And that was just almost completely dry. See it right here where it's almost complete. Well, it is. It's dry right here. And you can do this for about an hour or so with the, with the heritage. But see, I'll pick it right back up here and blend this out and soften that whole thing out. And bye-bye goes all, all, all that blending goes in there again. If that's what you want to do is really blend, that's what you can do. Now, I've never, I've never really showed that in any of my videos and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the things we designed Heritage to do. But I've never really showed that because you, we paint too thin. And what we really got to do is be able to take our, our scraper... We're going to do that in the future. We're going to scrape a rose <laughs> and put that on. Put that on really thick. And you get that paint on there really thick like that, then you can use water and water in those techniques. You don't have to have extender to blend. You can use water. We're acrylics. We've got to own these acrylics. We, these are beautiful techniques. And the one thing I love more than anything else is that they dry. I like them dry. I can work right up on top of them, reset stuff without pulling holes. Sometimes when your paint's too wet for too long, you can't work up on top of it. You have to let it tack up. Yeah, Mark. So if you're thinking that you're using too much pressure, would you first say, um, yeah. would you would you say add more, maybe the pro problem really is not the pressure, but the quantity of paint? Exactly. Yes, that's right. So if you're not getting that blending with that little bit of water, you don't have enough paint down to begin with. You're just pushing around transparent color and it's too weak. It's too weak on the surface. Now, you're just doing something, you know, especially if you were like me. I mean, I wrote books with bottled colors and thin craft colors and, you know, and we used those for stroke works and hindelope and scrolls and rose mauling and stuff. We thinned those out so that we got these beautiful long scrolls without granulation into them. And so we, but what happens is you, as an artist, you get really used to working with those colors really thin. And that's where the problem is. You need to use more paint. You need to go up to more impasto techniques. And once you go up to more impasto techniques, thicker colors, thicker stuff happening, you can you can blend this stuff. I mean, you know, so what did I do? This this water, where the water wasn't, this is still wet. Where the water is, it's drying out. Because I forced a, a, a faster drying element into my rose. So now what do I got to do? Well, I got to go back and restate my bowl again so that D thinks that this is an absolutely amazing rose here. And yeah, we'll push that in here. And we'll reset uh, the center in here. And, you know, in some of the books and DVDs and stuff that I do and in and, and the class videos and stuff, you will see me do stuff like this and reset the rows and reset the rows. And what I'm looking for more than anything else is beautiful color, color movements. And so I'll push in unusual colors into the, you know, into the back of a rose like this and push that yellow around a little bit. And I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for color movement now. And then I'll use the lighter colors, the lighter tones. I'll come in here like this and I will uh, start to build I'll start to build and it'll take a while because I have a lot of color down there. It'll take a while to um, to build the rose, to build the shape of the rose. But this is where you get really beautiful roses when you start to build them. What I do like to do when I get them like this is I like to let them, after I get the movement in here, I like to let it tack up a bit because once it's tacked up, it's easier to paint on. But to see, if I come in here, there's a lot of paint here. And if I come in here and put my white in like this, see, put my white stroke on, and then I keep working that, the white's just gonna disappear into the yellow. And it's, I mean, it's all gonna be gone. So I would have to, what I look for is, here's the power of the stroke here. I might take a, 
softer yellow here on the edges or maybe a little yellow and a little bit of uh, red violet what is this a half tone and I might hit the edge of it with the half tone and hit the edge of that right there with the half tone and leave some of that powerful stroke that's on there or I paint really really thick or I let it dry up but I don't work it too many times see I stroke it again and that white starts to disappear so I have to if the white disappears if you're doing this if you can't if you can't do that and that stroke looks like that instead of that you don't have enough paint does that make sense that stroke when you come in here and you lay us you should be able to lay a white stroke on and see it that's enough paint and then you have enough paint to push if you want to push this around and soften this around and push push this right into a rose and, and just push those colors right around and make the whole side of a rose there if you want here it takes practice it only takes about 400 roses but it takes you can do this we'll put an extra little petal over here a little bit dry but I can push or I can half tone but I'll build and build and build now as I if I want to affect just a little bit I lighten the pressure on my brush here and I affect it just a little bit but I want to get a nice heavy stroke here of white really push that in there with the light stroke and this hopefully yep it's this it's you can hear that you hear that that tackiness right there you, when you push your finger on that see here you won't hear it not as much but here that's where you hear it. You leave that little fingerprint right there. That's where I really like to lay in the color now because the white stays up on top, see? So I put on the white, the heavier white that's right here, and then I let that, I can push into that really easy and get some beautiful petaling effects right there just like that under the edge. When that color gets sticky, if it's too wet, you push and it disappears. So I like that. I like the colors sticky so when I'm painting a lot of trays and doing a lot of stuff what I do is I'll work four or five roses at the same time letting them dry up a bit and become sticky that's how that's what I like to do and I like the stickiness of it I'm gonna put a little more yellow in here see I can restate push that in and out put in a little more yellow I like to have strikes of color I like stuff not to be super smooth here moving around is everyone still alive oh yeah. yeah yes yes karen loves texture yes uh, texture diane's a friend. little uh afraid of it uh, no she's a little afraid of that scraper that you're using <laughs> so were you going to do a road no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and all no, margo right. can say is i love color i love color, 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 color. color. Yes. <laughs> yes so sometimes i will do this okay i'll show you this i'll build up a lot of paint right here of white and pull this down into here like this. Then, and this is a landscape technique that I use on the seascapes. I take the dark and paint back into it like this to take some of it back out. I do that too. That's another technique that I haven't done too much with it, you know, shown too much. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. But the key to everything, the key to everything is enough paint. Now, see, when I push like this, I'm, I'm disappearing my white. What do I have to put out there? More white I just have to take another stroke or a strike of white and pull that in and push that into there and you know get that nice movement that I want to have there whatever you want to have but I can uh, put a softer half tone in here let's work that around let's let's pretty up this rose here right now so that you guys think I know how to paint so I'll put a little cooler quinacridone right over here. I love that into those. I love quinacridones and yellows. The cool and the warm of that. I love those going in together. Let's put a little quinacridone back here. Now see, that's a harsh line right there. How would you soften it? You might have a hard time softening it with the, um, you know, with the shear, especially when your finger looks like that. <laughs> so it's all messed up. So you might have to go to a half tone. Might have to put a tone right in between the two of them. And maybe a little darker red violet again just restate that again down into the center and you get all this beautiful movement that's pretty movement in here you can drop some of those little pinky petals right down here drop that down the side here hit the side of that like that it's like you know what you're doing I I play with these things I well let me just say I 
I work these things. I've, you know, this year one of the things I did when I when I filmed this guy right here and what I say that this is my five hundredth painting this year. I was just about to number it and it's five hundred. I've done five hundred paintings this year. A lot of them are like this small study pan paintings where I'm practicing and doing. Um, you know, a lot of uh, different techniques. The big trays. Can, can I see one of those trays, Jessica, and stuff? Um, in that answer video that's here, you know, that the one video that uh, I put on their video answers. If you haven't seen that, you need to go over and see that because I show this tray. Let's put this tray down here. This this tray that, that I, I paint in here, in that video, I paint up on top of this rose, even that's you know, those varnished. And I show you how to make a beautiful, how to make more petals and stuff like that into the uh, into the um, uh, the rose here without, all I have to do, it's value. You have to use the right, correct, you have to use the correct value. And this is the key, when you, when you want to have something, really you need to have it wet and stay wet. You're using the wrong color because you should be able to just put something in here like that, put on a little highlight, put on another petal. If you're using the right value of something or the right intensity, you should be able to drop another color in there. Now, let's put that petal on, then I'm gonna drop the value down, maybe one, almost two, and drop the edge of it right there and push that right into the edge of the rose. And that works because I'm using the correct color and it looks like that's, it actually makes that rose a little prettier. <laughs> you know, sometimes I hate it when I do that. <laughs> you know, I can come in here and say, hey, let's put a little bit of light. Now, in that answer video, video answers, I'll paint all over this one, you'll see that. But I'll come in here and shove a little light on that. Now, to soften that, I can shear it or I drop its value down. I don't blend it. I don't blend it. That's just going to create all kinds of problems. You don't need to. I can let that dry. I just need to hit a little half tone on it, maybe just a little darker half tone right here. Hit that. Maybe I'll shear that and soften that. Dave, I can build it up even a little bit more. I Dave, can build that up just a little bit more. Yeah. We have a lot of new people. Could you please um, talk about half tone a little bit? Sure. Diane's just not really sure what you mean when you say use. You know, when you talk about the half tone technique. The half tone. The half tone technique. It's a yeah. great question because well, it's, a good it's fantastic. As a matter of fact, so all of this, all this entire floral that's here is painted pure acrylic. Sometimes I really chunk on the paint. You can really see it chunked on because it's painted for optical blending. And so when you when you step back and you look at it like this from right there, see, that's a pretty tray because it's painted off because you're looking at it. It's about between here and the camera is about three feet. So you're looking at this about three feet. I usually paint a tray like this and stuff to be viewed at three to six, mostly around six. Uh, bigger paintings. This is this is all painted optically. The horses, the mountains, everything here is all painted. This is in the new Westerns class, and uh, this one that's right over here. When you you see all of this, you know what what looks like all of this lovely blending kind of stuff here on on the scene here with the uh, the horse, and or, or his shirt. Look at his shirt that that's there. And you think that's all blended and everything. No, this is 100% acrylic, optically painted. And the paint up here is so thick. But how do I go about, uh, let me switch this over to the down shot here. How do I go about making his shirt here look that? You can see all of the interest and stuff there that goes in this. Look at the values. Look at the colors in his hat. Look at the dog that's all in there. That You would think you have to paint that with oils. No. That's all painted acrylic, and it's it's just because I use the correct tone. I strike it once or twice, and I use the correct tone on it. Uh, and that's the most important part of it. Let me set this back, and I'll show you exactly. Was it Diane, you said? Yeah, Diane. Yeah. It was okay. a great question. We all need the it's reminders exactly. and refreshers. So, and... Diane, let's say we want to go fix Dee's rose over here that she thought it was gorgeous right now, okay? <laughs> I want to come in here, and I want to fix that. So what, what an artist does if we paint in half tones, okay? And basically your half tone can be, uh, and, and this is one reason why we're gonna do the, the, the color class and everything is because we're gonna, we're gonna use a lot of different techniques. I'm gonna show you a lot of different techniques. But how do you soften, this is all dry. 
So everyone thinks I got to get it wet again to blend it. No, you don't. What you've got to do is this is my original tone. It's actually just a lot, a little bit lighter because it's scraped on there. This is on the outside. I'm down about here, which you always have your little value scale, which I don't have right now. So don't do what I'm doing. But so it's oh, going to be. Oh, we can fix that. Do you want to fix that? Huh? So do you have the value scale right there? I'm, I'm sure there's one in your filming studio because you yeah. always, well, I always it have it. I always have it. I can always have it. Yes. And so. Here would be the value of this one here. So basically that rose, and it doesn't have to be perfect. That rose is going to be right in here between these two colors, okay? Right here between these two values, the darker color and the lighter color. And all I do is create one right in between. And you can look at it right here. You can look at it, one color right in between here and right in between here. And that's what you strike first right on the edge of that to soften that shadow. Now, if I want to soften this edge here I make a half tone now between here and here I go up towards this one and I go about halfway between this and that so it's going to be right about that color and I strike that one on that edge there two touches of the brush here two touches of the brush and it softens out so what you're doing basically here is you're working the value scale I identify thank you Jessica very mm -hmm. much so I identify my values, I identify that I'm out here about an 8 and my dark is down here a 4 to a 3 to a 4. So I've got to strike on, so if I'm right about here and I'm right about here, somewhere right in here I've got to make a color right about here. That's the half tone of what you see there. And then if I want to soften it again, I make one right between. So if I want to soften that again, I go out here one more time, a little bit lighter right out to here like that, and I push that on, maybe one or two strokes. And now, I'm not blending. These paints are dry, but it's starting to look blended. But what I'm doing is putting on the tone, and I can lighten that edge. I can get rid of all the interest to it at all, you know, completely here, and take it all out to that, and at the very end, smooth it out like that with your finger like that. and it looks blended, but it's not. And it's not wet. It's dry. It's dry paint. This is called optical blending with the half tones. And where, where this gets great is, uh, you know, in the years that I was an oil painter, I, there sometimes I wanted to move on. I wanted to get something else in there or, you know, put something else on. But I couldn't because it was wet. And especially if the paint's thick, it's really wet, and then you try to do something, you can't because there's too much paint on the surface. You have to let them dry down. You have to let them dry up and, and some of the solvent to burn out. But the acrylics, well, I could go hit it with the hairdryer or just wait a few minutes until it starts to tack up. Then I can really work it. I can really, really work it. So that's what I do here. So. So here you see that that starts to look fair. Let's, let's soften out right here. Let's just take a color. I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be halfway somewhere. So let's just take a little tone here, somewhere in between, and strike it over that right there. And I soften that edge. Now let's go a half bit lighter, a little bit more white, not pure to white, and strike it right there. Get a little more paint there, Dave. Now all of a sudden that looks blended all the way out to here. I can shear it to really smooth it out if I want to, but that's where you start to to uh, to get that smoothness. Now this is the way that I love to paint, and <clears throat> in the S one hundred four in the Mortimer's lesson, this is how I really like to paint with those roses at the end. I like because this is dry. I like to just drag this heavy color over the edge like that and create this textured movement, and then I like to come in and soften some of that with a half tone in and out like that and use your paint and you know what your paint's going to dry up here you can add water to it but if you add water to it you uh, start to get problems because you make it dry faster you could add extender then for me it dries too slow I just use more paint I get more paint I come out here and I strike and I put up and I strike more paint here and 
I'm going to come right down here. I'm going to put a half tone right in there, soften that out. I don't want to get rid of all my movement of my pedal. But see, this is all dry. Now that's looking blended here because I'm striking the correct tone. Does that make sense? I'm striking, I'm working up and down that value scale, striking a straight color. What oils do and what uh, acrylics, and, and I think, this is the real problem, you know. For many years, I made a mistake as, a, as an artist, as a chemist and everything, thinking that I had to make these acrylics act like oil so people can blend and emulate this. And these acrylics do such fantastic looks if you use the right tone. So instead of painting like oils, we need to paint like acrylics. We need to get this blending out of our mind and we need to switch over to half tones and shearing, pedal edges and doing all that kind of fun stuff. And that is where the interest and stuff we can drive. And so when this starts to tack up like this, it's really easy for me to come in here and say, okay, I'm gonna put a pedal right on here. Now I will stop short of pulling too far into the bowl. And then I just go in here and grab a half tone right in here like that and strike that right there like that and I blend it right into the bowl. Two, two strokes, backhand, forward and backhand. Right. <laughs> and snap it's done. And snap, and snap, you get a you get a pedal. Maybe I'll slide this right in here onto the edge like this and and I'll start to pull in a pedal like this and I'll start I'll stop short right in there of my shadow. I'll look where I am here. I'm not gonna try to blend that out. I can shear it, I can shear it, but where you get your best look, I feel, is we'll go a little darker half tone here. We'll put one in there like that so it goes down into that shadow nice. I could shear that edge there if I wanted, but then we'll go up uh, another tone lighter and we'll strike that and then rather than pushing and trying to blend that, that see, I sometimes I'll leave that. It depends on the position of the flower. I'll leave that much difference there. That's more contrast. Sometimes I'll take just another little half tone right there and soften it. And now that thing looks splendid. So sometimes I leave those, those differences. Depends on the position of the flower, the importance of the flower. Depends on, you know, where it is in the composition and how much interest I want this flower to have. Strike that. So here I struck this on there really nice and thick so I get a layer here. I should put a little warmth in over there. So we'll drop down to a half tone, maybe a little warmer color. And I'm just going to strike that right across. I love to do this. Strike that. So now I've got a warm color in there. Now all i got to do as an artist is bring these together. Don't blend them. Just bring them together. That's my color. I'll head to my light. So I go out to the light edge of the petal there and maybe shear that edge there. So now it's nice and smooth and beautiful and you know what you're doing. And I'll hit this one over here. Maybe a little bit more to the light right out there. Maybe right here if you want this super, I'd leave it. Sometimes I will push it up like this so I get that movement up. But if you wanted that more blend, you got to head between this color and the white, you got to get it a little bit right between a white and that color there and push that in. And then that looks super blended and perfect. All this is on a dry flower. All this is just working half tones and it looks amazing. Right, Jessica? Oh, yes. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Diane asks if oil painters um, discuss their techniques in terms of half tones as well. Or is it strictly uh, an acrylic? No. There are, well, see, this is Diane's asked this? Yes, Diane. Yeah, okay. That is a great question, okay? Professional painters, especially the ones that head towards Impressionism, do half tones and strike colors and do that kind of stuff. Myself, as a beginner oil painter, and a lot of other things, we blend it because that's all we think oils can do. But what, as you, and just like what I'm doing now, what I paint now. And this year I took a huge jump. Wouldn't you say I took a huge jump in, in everything I paint? It's because I quit trying to paint like an oil painter and blend. I went over back to my pure acrylic th stuff exactly with some of my, the great painters that I watched, the Bill Antons, the Josh Riches, the, 
Jason Riches, I mean, and the guys who paint Westerns and do this, and um, people who paint wildlife, and, and, you know, even if you look at Rick Richard Smith and his Ola Prima, pure Ola Prima technique, they don't blend. They paint in oils, but they don't blend. They paint in tones. Strikes of the brush and put the tone on. And some of them say you should never strike one tone more than three times. And that's what I say now in my classes too. Don't strike it more than three times because you eliminate the, uh, you, you blend it too much. You eliminate that contrast. In other words, instead of blending something out to make it, to make it uh, flow into it, to do what we call incorporate the color. You'll hear me say that in all these classes. I'm going to incorporate the color. When I say incorporate the color, that means I'm going to bring the two tones closer together. Now, sometimes I do it by pushing the color. Sometimes I do it by shearing the color if one is wet and one's dry. Sometimes I do it with the half tones. Most of the, the really, let me say, the high quality professional artists do it with a tone. But that means you need to know color. You need to know how to make those tones. You, you need to train your eye to see those tones again. That's one reason why Jessica and I decided we were sitting there going, we've got to redo some of the color theory that we have. The original color theory that I shot on the DVDs, the first beginning color theory, I think was the finest class that I've ever made because it really shows you eye how to see color. But one area that I didn't go into was uh, the impressionistic look and the optical part of painting. And that's really where we want to go now, into the pure optics. And so when you're done, you know, when you're done painting something here, like look at the palette here, and this is what I tell my students. When you're done with a painting like this, you're, and I walk around and I look at my, my stuff all the time. I don't know if Serena's online or here on stuff. I always tell her, your palette tells your painting. You can see my strikes of my tones, where my tones are here. But if your palette looks like this, all one tone across like that, that shows me you're blending because you're working too much on your, on your, on your, uh, your palette. You should be seeing tones. You should be stepping out and seeing tones like this. Does that make sense? Seeing the tones. Yeah, Jay. Kudos from Dee. She says you made a huge leap this year in your painting. <laughs> I, I, I feel that I have, and especially now, uh, this doesn't scare me. <laughs> when I first did this, and we first did this out in Sydney, it was like, oh, I hope this works. <laughs> 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 you know, and... When I put that video up, hopefully we'll get it uploaded uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. We'll get it up in Art Videos directly. It'll be a free one. Watch for it. And uh, I took Jay up there to watch the, the editing of it when I did this. And I take this big old massive amount of paint and I just draw it across the, uh, the surface here to create the depth of the painting. And, you, and I, <laughs> I tell everybody in there, please don't have a heart attack right now <laughs> because... It, because I use a technique in there that's different than any of the other landscape techniques I have. I use a painting out, a negative with the dark. So I over apply the light and paint it out with the dark. And it's the thick paint because the, the thalo that I use in there has more power than the light. It's because thalo is a powerful, a powerful pigment. This is one of the things that I want to teach you in the color theory. Okay, That will not work with quinacridone over the white because that quinacridone is not as powerful as the white. So you need to know your colors just a little bit. But in that painting where there's a lot of blue, blue's the dominant color. That's the one I use to take out everything. So I overpaint the white and take it out with the blue to create all those little waves. And in just a second, you create the waves. You know, and I used to blend them. Now I just drag it on there and then incorporate it with some different techniques. A lot of times it's a half tone or it's a dragging technique with the brush. How I use the brush or how I use the scraper. It's a different way of looking at it. And if you can get enough paint, you can paint beautiful things. But you gotta get the paint thick. You gotta get that stuff thick on there. And that gives you more possibilities to your paintings. I think one of the biggest changes we've seen this year in terms of your painting technique has been the way you use your brush. A totally different. Yeah. It's very different. You know, when we think about 
the journey many of us have had coming through, you know, coming up through decorative or folk art painting has been a lot of side loading right. and right. and very very stylized. Yeah, a lot very stylized and then 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 you look where you are this year and it's uh, much more impressionistic, much yeah. more just laying on the colors completely di and you talk about trying to paint like wells, not trying to paint like wells, trying to paint like acrylics. I think it's just you're painting you pushed your brush. One needs to push yourself into a different direction periodically so that yeah. you can grow. And I think this for you, you pushed your brush on what you're gonna what you're gonna do with the brush. Yeah, exactly. How you're gonna put paint on and what media you're and, gonna and, and most of that, Murphy, and, mo and, and most of that, and Jay knows this, Deanne, you know this because we paint a lot together. And is that I'm constantly talking about edges. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the edges. How I mean. You know, are you are you doing something that's a real granulated edge? You know, up here where your interest is gonna is gonna be. Are you dragging? You know, are you dragging that brush up over here to create that smooth edge? And one of the things I showed Jessica on this video is that I I I took this scraper and I I plowed on the white right across the whole front here, and then I took a violet color and I used my fusion brush and I just go about incorporating it, fixing up how I want that wave to go. And I will pull it across the hair like this. I gotta do everything in reverse here. Pull it across like this to create real bubbly effects. So this real bubbly effect that you see up into this area, right up and through here, this bubbly effect here, that is done by my brush pulling across this way. If I want it smooth, like uh, you see this it's opposite. <laughs> this is just so strange. It's opposite. So when you see this area up here where it's smooth here, that is done. Well, I could just do it this way. Go on the down shot. Let's do it this way. That's easier <laughs> <laughs> than holding that up and doing that. So when I'm coming in here, when you watch this video, and I think you should watch this video, I see in there, I want to create more bubbly work in here. I drag against the hairs of the fusion. When I want to create the water flowing in like this, this is one stroke right down through here. I plowed on this thick of white all the way to the rocks here, and then I took a blue right out here like this and just pulled it like that and took it back out because the blue is powerful that way to take that back out. And it works. It, all these clouds you see up here just working, that's just, that's just different gray. Here's a value up and here's a value up. And I put a little water in it so I get a little transparency and I just drag the brush. If I want it more more things, I drag it this way. If I want to get it smooth like I did right up against the edge of the hill, I took it and made a mark like that. And then I push a little tree right up in front of it to incorporate it back up into that. You get these wonderful little deaths. I drag white right across the edge here. And then I take blue and I paint it right back out. It's a wonderful video for some of you to look at this, but this is what I'll do on roses as well. If I want something really smooth, but look at all the, the textures that are up here. Now, this is the way impressionists, this is the way the beautiful oil painters paint. They leave the difference between the tones here. That's not smooth. That's not blended out. They leave this difference between the tones because that's interest. And as you step further back, you you know, from this painting, and you and you go back, wherever my little clicker is here. Boy, man loses his clicker. He's lost a lot here. Let's step this back just a little bit. As I step back a little bit more, see how those edges become softer? They start to they start to optically blend. And the the more and more and more you step back here, the further back that you get, the more this whole painting starts to soften out and optically blend. Now, the problem, the problem, if I set it way back to here, this really, really optically blends and, and looks like a thousand dollar painting, doesn't it? Oh, more than that. More than that, yeah, I yeah. think so, huh? Well, you look at some of these landscape painters that, and Margo, you know that, you've painted with some of them out there. So they're great painters and they don't do any blending with that, they optically paint. And they'll take a painting that's this, this size and they'll sell for $2,000. And but they don't they're not blended. They're optical strokes. They're half tones. Mm -hmm. They're half tone paintings. So that when you hang them on the wall, 
they have a certain amount of interest and the artist is looking at how far back how much you bring that tone together so that your eye blends it at six feet seven feet ten feet that's what you're determining when and so what I used to do is I used to paint these I used to paint or tried to paint landscapes try to paint these things and I would get in there and I'd be painting it right up here underneath my nose and blending the heck out of it hanging it on the wall and it looks really really flat that's the problem and I was just doing that just last year even that's what I was doing and that was the problem um, can you go over there and hand me that elk that mm -hmm. I did over there um. And then can you talk a little bit about the um, the thickness of the paint on your palette at all? Really thick, right from the tube. Right from the tube. I, you you never it? saw me once today, this evening. Um, you never you saw that? me once add anything to that paint. Like, oh, I did a little bit of water like, here. Um, I paint right straight from the tube as impasto. Do you need? Do you ever? I feel like you need to let it tighten up on the palette itself. Yes, sometimes I do. What sometimes you, we let that. Well, what about using texture medium or foam medium? Would either Let's one just of those? Step in front of the camera. Show me everyone your beautiful green hair. My daughter has green hair for Christmas. I love color. <laughs> she does. <laughs> she truly, really does. Yes, but this is a painting that you guys haven't seen here, and I did this out in Sydney a couple years ago, and um, it. I stopped it because, and I, because it's just too smooth, and what I do now has so much more, you know, so much more interest and stuff. But when I got in here and I was working on uh, this elk, let me go to the down shot here on the elk. I was blending way too much, way, way, way too much, and I don't paint that way anymore. I leave powerful strokes and stuff. I can paint the horns like no get out. But when you when you paint horns like that, there's no blending on the horns. Have a, but antlers, antlers, please. Yeah, the antlers. Excuse me. <laughs> on his antlers. We're gonna get emails. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but the body here, look how smooth it is because that's the way I was still painting there. And this was just a couple of years ago, not more than two years ago, maybe 18 months ago or so, that I did that. And then. That's what started me to on this journey of trying to get more edges. And so I, I moved into more wildlife painting. And then what did it for me was the Western painters. The Western painters having to, to paint that out because getting that horse or getting that tack put onto that horse and putting on with certain amount of edges and textures and stuff and thick paint and stuff going on makes it uh, makes it come forward more gives it more interest and that stroke that stroke sets up the muscling of the of the horse and so you've got to plan the stroke the texture the amount of paint and everything and that really helped me and that changed my flowers that's changed everything that i do i look at it completely different so would you use texture medium in your paint if you thought it wasn't tight enough or thick enough that's a really good question do you do you use texture medium and stuff into your paint would you you know, if not, you know one of the things I was discussing with Jessica as we were driving back from Sydney, this stuff, and I was sitting there going, you know, the, the white paint and everything. I mean, we have this paint about as thick as you can have it to still get it out of the tube right now with this type <laughs> of tube that we have. But I was telling her, I said, I really, really want to get some thicker paint. I mean, that's something that we, we've got to either develop by either adding it you know the a, the texture medium and postoing type techniques to do that not really at the very beginning of the painting but especially towards the end of the painting or the front like the front rocks and the water get some of that stuff in there and it's like what i say in this video i hope you all go over and watch this video um i say it's that thickness of the paint that you have on there that that makes it look like a painting it feels like a painting. You rub your hand over it and you feel, and it feels like a painting, and it's the power of that that makes it, you know, feel all that way. That's what that's what I, I really like. Now, let's go over and check. Mm -hmm. Let's go over and check this real quick. So this is dry. This one's dry. This one right here is still wet. So this is still wet. So the the extender in it is still wet. 
The thicker acrylic now is dry. That one's really dry. If I want this to, to even stay wet longer and blend more into it, you can just put some extender right into it and you'll reconstitute that right back up. Got pink from my finger and you'll blend right into it. This right here, you might be able to pick it up with a little bit of water. Yeah, you can. And make that lighter pink from my finger there. But you'll pick up the, the color there still. Give it that. Now that's been on there an hour. And I can still do that. I can still blend that into a, a light pink right there. It's been on there an hour with just the thick, the thicker acrylic. The extender makes it even more. The whole key to everything is thicker paint. And I and myself included in this, myself included in this, guys, I didn't use enough paint for the longest time. And I and in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, I gotta blend like oils, I gotta blend like oils, I gotta blend like oils, and I don't do that anymore. And you know, and I didn't even use any water really on this one right here. It was just right out of the right out of this, you know, this area here. Now this is dry here. But I can use my dirty finger here, and I can reconstitute this. See, I can pull through here, and I can go all the way down here, and pull it right down to the pat, right down to the palette here. I can reconstitute it. Like I say, you can do that for about an hour or so. I don't want to though. That makes my rose look too blended, too flat. It makes it look lifeless. What I'd like to do is to come in here. Take my, my color, just take some thick paint, not even any water in my brush. And let's come out here and let's just strike another petal right across here like that. Now, how do I, how do I incorporate that petal with, uh, you don't need to go buy another medium. Well, we want you to buy another medium, but you don't <laughs> go out there and buy another medium. You know, uh, you don't get frustrated with it whatsoever. You look at this tone. You look at this tone and you make one right in between. That's one way. You can shear it, like I said, you can just shear it off there like that. I'll let this dry up a little bit here though. And it'll take a while because there's no hot air up here right now. It's just, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes, and, but what I gotta do is I had a little bit of my violets. I don't have to make exactly the same tone. I'll put a little yellow right here because that's a little violet and yellow. And I'll just lighten it up a bit, lighten it up to where I feel that it's going to be right between those two. And if I come off, that's all right. I just strike it again. So it's going to be a little bit lighter. And notice how I'm stepping off to the side when I'm doing this, I'm not taking one thing. I'm watching my values get lighter and lighter and lighter till where I feel that I'm close. I can strike that right there and start the softening of it. I can head this way to a little bit more of that yellow and set that into that right there. Maybe a little strike here, boom. And I can go a little bit lighter right here. And notice I'm just striking once or so with each stroke. And all of a sudden I incorporate that petal right into that rose. And if I want, I can shear it a little bit now. I can shear it because I got enough paint on there, but I can shear it and lighten it up and blend it off. And I, and I struck the rose, I, I pulled the stroke here right on a dry area and then incorporated it into the rose. That's how I like to do it. Sometimes I'll take that color up, we'll just reincorporate it all right here and strike the front of that rose again like that. And let's just drop a new little shadow right there because you can go both ways. You can increase your shadow and step into the flower. Push it around a bit. I like to push that around and incorporate that into the rose. But you can start painting petals, painting your rose in, I like to say, embrace the acrylic part of the painting, which means you're gonna become a tonal painter, which, and that's what, that's, that's what, isn't, see how pretty that's starting to come there? I can, all I have to do is strike a little bit of light, take a little bit of light right here, just strike the edge of that. Maybe put a little bit of a half tone right there. Boom. You get a nice light little petal there, you know. But it's it's knowing it's knowing some of the tones. And so, you know, Richard Smith, if you have never looked at his paintings, they're absolutely amazing. All the Prima artist. And one of the things, and he doesn't do any blending. Look at it, look him up online. He has the uh, and we have his Alla Prima books and the companion to Alla Prima painting books. They're really nice, but 
in his first one, the or actually it's in the companion book, there is the whole center section of the book is doing nothing but like little color studies, little color here, 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 advancing the tone warmer and cooler and this. And he says, before you can be an artist, he says, you got to paint these charts because you got to train your eye to see these tones and see that color so that you can strike that with one powerful stroke of the brush. And then I was reading about Bill Anton, the 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 Western painter, one of the greatest Western painters. A painting that's this size that he does right there goes for about sixty thousand dollars. He is absolutely amazing. He's two years older than me, so I got two years to do this. But he is absolutely amazing artist. Um, and he he said the key to a beautiful painting is to like put in a cloud with one expressive stroke of your brush not to not to overwork something he says every element should be put in with one expressive stroke and so i'm sitting there going well if you're putting on one expressive stroke you're not blending and so that's where my flowers now came more to life because i don't blend it i leave that optical difference of those tones and that's where my wildlife is. I, I learned how to start leaving those optical differences by painting elk. And I took another jump this year by painting horses because I got to paint those muscle structures and stuff. Which, you know, and, and that's why I say to a lot of you, you don't paint beautiful roses by practicing and practicing and practicing roses because you'll have habits and those habits will stay there. You need to step away from that, go take a big scraper, scrape a bunch of paint onto the thing and break some of those habits of your habit of applying paint, trying it on something completely different. Then when you go back to that again, you'll be a different artist. Does that make sense? He's pushing yourself into a different direction. Pushing yourself into a different direction. And what's causing that is you're, you're painting totally out of your world. And I know that sounds crazy. I want to paint more beautiful roses, so I better go paint the ocean. No, that's true. Because the ocean has a different movement to it. And so that gets you used to using your brush different. Gets you used to using more paint or less paint. A different amount of everything. And that's what's going to make you a better painter. That uh, particular thing there. So as you come around here... You know, and, and painting this rose, as I come around here, this is my shadow side here. I would toss in a little more shadows. If I want that to tone down, this is some of the stuff you use, I toss a little green in it. That'll gray my color down, tone it down here. And I'll push a little bit of that nice tone, cool color right into that right there. I may reset some of my colors. There's a thousand ways. You'll watch me do this in all the classes. You'll watch me in all the books. I try to do different things. Uh, if I feel that that's a little bit too much there, I just take that and I shove it over here to a half tone right in between those two. Maybe warm that just a bit back up over here. And if something dries on my palette, I make the tone again. And that is one of the greatest things. Don't sit there and add water to this to loosen it all up because you don't want to make that tone again. Where you get beauty in your painting is when you make that tone again. And remember, artists, you remember what, you know, Smith and, and Anton and Jason Rich and all these guys say, to, and these beautiful, beautiful painters, they, they, they strike with that one tone. So once that tone is struck, they don't use it again. But we use, we used to, you know, when I started the first teaching, and I first started painting, I was like, oh, the backgrounds had to be perfect. Everything had to be perfect. And if I was going to make a blue flower, everything was based that blue flower. Okay. And then I come around. And if I run out of blue, it's like, oh, my goodness, I ran out of that blue. What do I do? How do I make that exact color again? The difference that I look at painting now is once I make that color and I strike it on that one flower, I never want to use that color exactly in that particular tone of warm or cool, uh, it's grayness, saturation. I never want to use it exactly at that tone again. That's where your paintings come to life. If you spread this all out, then at the same tone out, your painting doesn't have as much life. You know, you go down and look at my palette here. Those are beautiful colors. All these colors here for the roses. All these tones here 
all those tones work within the roses here. Some warmer, some cooler. These tones, look at those two tones and stuff together. But if I paint my whole rose right in here, it's not as interesting as if I add some of this tone, the warms, and some of these other tones and get some of these other colors in there. Or get a red in there to begin with, you know. Um, how do you go about, you know, softening? Now the paint's dried up in my brush, so I gotta rinse it just a bit. But I don't rinse it to add water to my paint to do this. I just go down. This is how I paint. I go down and I grab myself some more color, some more paint. Here, I want to gray that slightly, so I'm going to add a little green to that, gray that down here. But this is where I can come back in and soften out this side of the rose. Maybe I'll drop into down here to its get a half tone in between those two. And then I'll drop a little deeper to put a little darker tone right into the center of that rose because we want this rose to look absolute, absolutely gorgeous, even though Dee already saw it, it looks gorgeous. But I'll, and I'll soften the edges here. Boom, I just soften the edges back like that a little bit. And I start to build it, I'll start to build. Now, you know, over here I might have, you know, more petals, but slightly cooler here. If I get too much or if I, I always do what I say, restate your shadow, pull that back in, pull some color, get some movement. I love to have color movement. Here I've got a little bit too much, so I'll strike a half tone right in here and just push that around a bit and I get that lovely movement right in there into the rose. That's what I like to do. And if I want to make a lighter petal here, so I'm painting this pure acrylic. I have enough paint on here to do anything um, that I want to do. If I want to put strike another petal right in here, let's put another petal right in there like that. Maybe this petal comes out like this, this side over here a little bit. And then I look at this. Do I want to incorporate that? I can shear it to incorporate it in like that, to push it in as part of that petal. I mean, part of that uh, bowl there. Maybe I want to pop this up just a little more white. Pop that edge up. Shear that. Or half tone it. Half tone that in and incorporate that in. How much I leave between these tones depends on how far back I want to see this rose. Because this is this is really kind of too much too blended for something to hang on the wall. I like to have a little more contrast in that. But you can. You can have more contrast. And sometimes I won't even touch this out here. I may well, that's a little granular there, so I may take a little color and push it in like that. But I may come in here and you'll see me do other other techniques. I'm a technique painter. I may come in here with my first bit. And I, my first bit, I like to have a little contrast. So I take a little green and I take a little burnt umber or a little raw sienna, excuse me. So it's pine green, raw sienna, and I cool it with a little red violet. And this is where I do my negative painting. So I can make this all look like the side of a rose here or the end of the rose and pop that all off and make that look like petals by doing negative painting. I don't have to go out here and paint the edges of those petals there. I can... Uh, do this all with negative painting. So maybe I'll just lighten this up a little bit here. And see, I can make this all look like petals out here just by using my background and what will eventually be leaves out here. I can make that whole edge of a, a petal, make that whole rose get this light little strike of an edge. Or if I think that's too much there, maybe just push a little bit of light color. Now, you have to buy brushes. You don't always use your finger. <laughs> yeah. You have to buy brushes too. But see all that? That's the negative painting. That's the porcelain, the porcelain technique here. And I'll, I'll pull some of these colors out. Now this is what Schmidt does and a lot of them do. They, they come out here and you take your rose, you know, and I start getting just a little bit wild, crazy stuff and I'll, you know, put on a stem line or something like that to it. And I start to imagine the leaves and stuff where leaves are going to go out here and I will start putting and moving my colors out. I don't necessarily start by painting leaves. I'm moving my interest and my strikes and stuff like that out. And and that's the that's the kind that I really like. Now, up here is where I might add a little water and thin my color out. Put it right into some of these reds and stuff here so it becomes grayer and a little bit of water here. And you know, I might negative paint with a little thinner paint out here so it doesn't have as much power it's up on that one side but see all of that becomes 
I can smooth it all out or I can, you know, drag the green into the, the rose a little bit and drag that out. And so I can paint petals negatively too with the background. And then after I do that, then I can come in here and set in like a the shape of the leaf. I can start turning these into to leaves out here, painting into your ovals and stuff like that and come in and add little shadows and other little things and I do all different kinds of techniques but you can start seeing other little stuff but don't use the same green that's the other big thing everyone you know I, I did it for years and so learn from me use a different a different setup there a different color you know try something a little different get a little more color a little different coloring and stuff like that and start having some fun. If you want this shadow to soften out, hit it with a half tone and it'll soften out. And this is the impressionism of the painting, which I just absolutely love. And there's a thousand ways to do it. Now this rose was painted, this was the rose that looked really beautiful at the beginning, the acrylic that they really liked. <laughs> it was completely acrylic and I completely messed it all up. I completely messed it all up here and I came in and now you have this beautiful looking blended little rose right over here these color changes and everything that's like that and I didn't add a single drop of extender I didn't add on the rose I in the, in the water in the, the leaves I added a little water but on that rose I added no water what I did was I toned paint I painted with tone and this is one reason why uh, you know we just as I'm switching over to doing this I we've got to just become acrylic painters we've got to move away from blending because the acrylics really when I start looking at Anton and Jason Rich and Richard Smith and all of this stuff and the power of the stuff that they do with these tone strokes I look at it and I go that's easier to do with acrylic than it is with that oil because that oil you touch it one too many times and that tone disappears because everything is always wet. So you can really make a mistake really quick with that, uh, with that, with an oil. But with an acrylic, you can let it tap up, tack up, and it doesn't have that mistake. I just got to learn to use more paint. That's the real key. Use more paint, thicker paint, and you can do anything with that, right? And so we're going to put up some of these videos. And where I'm going to take all my teaching this year is that I've decided to do because this is where I'm heading is I'm going to take acrylics to a acrylic and we're going to work real heavy on on the acrylic part. And then, boy, when you go back and you add some of that extender in there and we did this the other day, we painted something globally, one of these flowers, and we're just like, this is way too wet way too long <laughs> because now we've totally gotten used to painting acrylic and Deanne will say that too she and Deanne knows that she, she said that the other day she tried to paint something back global again and she thought she was going to die because she's been painting pure acrylic and so once you get used to that pure acrylic you notice things you don't want things to stay wet because you don't blend and so this rose looks very very blended Especially when I step back like that. That rose looks really, really blended. And I go out here and fix this all up and do all kinds of art stuff on that. Looks really, really blended, but it's not. You saw the whole thing here. Pure acrylic, right? Right. Um, Diane loves the elk painting. Uh, Karen is super excited about the idea of having even thicker paint for more texture. Yep. And uh, Diane also had a question about the Dutch Masters technique versus uh -huh. your Western technique. Yeah. <laughs> because that is like opposite <laughs> ends of the spectrum. <laughs> I wish I had the Dutch Masters here. They're all out in Sydney right now. Well, she's you looking know. at doing it. Uh, she's, she's gearing up to take the Dutch Masters class. And... Um, wants to actually paint it in a stairwell in her house. Wow, good. Yes, so... Um, good luck. No, I mean, good. <laughs> That's a big thing. Stunning, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had one of my guys, uh, friends down in Australia that did it as a big fireplace cover. I think it was like six feet across. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Took him a, took him uh, two years to do the whole thing. But, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, he's, he asked me, he says, how do I get the pattern that big? So I sent him where it printed out. It printed out on, I think it was 80 pages, 88 and a half by 11 pages. He says that was 
a jigsaw and a half puzzle putting that together <laughs> and then he transferred the whole thing but yeah they look amazing when they're that big that's good mm -hmm. that's good so i don't know if you wanted um to talk a little bit about the technique or maybe well um, the thing maybe is it would be yeah if and she's this looking is at the, the western how you yeah. approach them totally a, a contemporary you know some yeah. of the al primo versions of your dutch also right. I looked for paintings around the house, but we took them all to Nebraska. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> we took them all to Nebraska. There's the, uh, you know, and I, I really like that one where we redid that Dust Masters, the Van Deel, because uh, that one is really, really smooth. And, you know, they do it, they did a thing, a technique called melting, where the color, they melted in. They put one tone, another tone, then they put a solvent right in between and let that eat away and melt the colors together. Now, they're painting more super realistic. But in the Dutch, like the Dutch class, like in the S104 class, uh, that's a really, really good class in that, because we paint all different types of techniques, and we just finished the Franz Mortemans, which is totally opposite of the spectrum of the Dutch in the same class. The Dutch do thin layers of color. As a matter of fact, into the Dutch class of the S104 and the other one, you actually, you don't paint with any texture whatsoever and you use even a razor blade to scrape back through to eliminate that texture. So you're just, you're putting on thin washes of color. And they used oils because oils is what they had. They didn't have acrylics. I, you know, this last one in the S104, we painted that really, really pretty one. And that was uh, done complete. I did that completely acrylic, completely acrylic, thin washes of color, thin washes with, with water, washes of the tone, let it dry, put the next color on, let it dry, the next color on, let it dry. You could actually paint it so much faster. They would work thin washes with the oils and they would wait, wait several weeks in between for these layers to dry. So they would work on six, seven, eight paintings in their studio at a time as they build and build and build these layers. But you start with the Grisai, a painting of black and white. Now, why did they do that? Because colors, during the Dutch golden age of the 16th, 17th century, especially all the way up into the middle part of the 18th century, the colors before, you know, manufacturing companies came in with two, with two colors, the colors were so expensive. So what they came up with a way is painting with the cheap ones, black and white, creating a, basically a black and white photograph and then washing color on it until they got the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the look of the painting. And so it's just thin, transparent washes. And I used to paint them with a lot of global colors, a lot of extenders. And this last year I painted the one in the S104 uh, class with uh, just extender, I mean, it was just water. And it worked beautiful. And, uh, I mean, the paintings came out beautiful. Then we turned around and painted global on some real thick stuff. And it's just, there are different, you know, techniques. I'm a techniques teacher. I study all different kinds. I travel around the world, study all different kinds of techniques. Because techniques is what makes you the artist. It's, it's like I say, I have a toolbox up here. And what I'm trying to do, like in the S104, is fill up your toolbox, and, you know, with these techniques from acrylics to to global colors and you put them all in here and yeah, maybe I'll pull out and may, you know, you know, uh, like Mary said, okay, what do I do when I come, come back, you know, three weeks later? Well, maybe I'll switch over to a, an acrylic halftone technique and get my painting going again. And, you know, or maybe I'll put down a layer of extender and paint into that. You, you have all these tools up here that you can pull from. And that's your job as the artist is to, to pull these tech, these ideas out. So you paint as many different types of techniques and things as possible. Put them all up into here and out will come yourself as an artist. That's where I am now. And, and there you got it. <laughs> that's that's incorporating it. We incorporate them. You put them all in here. Oh, incorporate it all up and start painting your painting. And now we're going to use a scraper. It's so cool. You know, It's going to be so much fun. And Karen, you're going to have a great time because we're going to put that paint on really thick. It was great because you put it on really thick and you direct it around with some of those darts. It was a different way that I've ever done a seascape before and I totally loved it. Totally loved it. Working that around with the scraper and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those kind of ideas with that scraper, I, you know, I got from this guy. He's a super master painter, Ken Knight down in uh, Australia. He uses the scrapers. He does them right. We saw him paint. We were just like, whoa. 
we got to try that. <laughs> and he uses these oils and he just, it's like each painting, he'll take a big, huge tube of white, squirt the whole thing out onto his palette. And he'll go through that entire tube of white paint during this painting. It's amazing that he puts this on there, but his paintings have so much depth and, and all of this stuff. And it's just energy because really, he just it's does energy, it. yeah, because he just attacks it. So, you know, that's that's you know where you got to go. So, you don't what I really want to do more than anything else, and what I wanted to do this evening with you is I, I want you to, to start or I, I want you to get away from thinking things have to be wet to paint them. That's really what I want, is they don't. Now, will that create some frustration? Of course it will, because you've got you've got to shift the way you think. You've got to shift the way you paint. You've really got to stop painting more than anything else. What you have to do is paint here. What you have to do is tone paint. And notice, see, even when I made my leaves, you notice me step off to the side and change the tone, change the tone, change the tone. I don't make it into the same puddle here. So like I say, if you have this all just big color here, puddle on your palette, look at your palette. If you don't see the tone stepping out, then you are blending. You're blending too much and you're thinking that I, I can't be an artist unless I blend. And that's not true. The artist, what you gotta do is you gotta optical paint. And what we have to do is we've gotta go through some color to see color better, you gotta be able to see warm and cools a little better, you gotta see that value, you gotta own that value scale. You really do, you gotta own that value scale, see what's between there, between the lights and the dark, and, and be able to hit that half tone. You don't have to hit it perfect, you just have to hit it somewhere between. And it's like a friend of mine told me a long time ago, if it doesn't look good, you know, hanging on the wall, if that doesn't look good, then step back a little further, put a chair in front of it, in front of the wall. And then put a table in front of it. I would keep stepping back, stepping back, stepping back until it starts to blend. Because at some point, it's going to blend. <laughs> Your eye's going to blend. It's going to blend. And I get more life to my paintings now when I, when I don't blend. And so it's just like this horse and stuff here. He pops so much farther forward because nothing up here is blended at all. It's tone painted. And I move the tones closer together, grayer together, more atmospheric as I head to the back. And the same thing over with this other guy over here. More atmospheric. And I bring the tones further apart there when I'm painting that dog and I do all that kind of stuff. And I physically, like when I'm doing something like that, I will physically take a, you know, a thick dollop of, of white like this onto it. And I set the fusion down where I hear it scrape on the edge of the palette and that's how I apply that highlight tone. So I get this variation here of that what I call the granulated part of it. The highlights and stuff come on like this. This is where I'm at with my painting now. Being able to leave this within the painting so that I don't blend it and that has a lot more interest in here. And that's why I say is I'm going to go, I, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to go where I can really drag like Mortimer's and, and really get that, you know, on there. And I did that dragging on Mortimer's and you get those edges, see those little fracturing edges and stuff like that. But for me, that paint has to be a little bit more dry for me to do that. But you get the fracturing part and that's optical. And you step back from that, that starts to look amazing, but you don't blend. That's the key, is you don't blend. Don't think that your paint has to be wet. You're an acrylic artist. Acrylic artists do it optically. So you do it through, you don't do it through blending. We don't need to toss in more and more and more. We can, if you wanna paint something and make it look blending and you're gonna paint it within an hour or so, an hour or two, the working time of the extenders and stuff like that, just normally, yeah, sure. Toss in the extender and do that and blend it. If you're gonna do it over a longer period of time, use the acrylics like the acrylics are formulated to do. Shear, the, the shear those edges, half tone those edges. And you can even let it dry up a little bit, take some water and go back over it and blend it if you have enough paint. There's a lot of techniques to it, but they're acrylic techniques. We don't need to paint like an oil painter. We need to paint like an acrylic painter. That is where I'm gonna go. That is what I'm gonna do because Acrylic techniques, as I look at what the what the 
beautiful painters do today. They leave a lot of these edges and you don't get those edges from blending. What are they saying that you're laughing there, Jane? <laughs> oh, sorry. Karen just says that she's ho she hopes she's not too old to find her own artistic voice. She's pushing the three-quarter century mark and still searching. And D There's a lot. There's says, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was a gazillion years old, and you're good, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You got all kinds of time. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. All we got to do, all we got to do is, I think at the end of this year, you know, after we do some of that color and we, and, you know, you go paint some of these different edges and, you know, you, I, Karen, you signed up, you just uh, did the trolling the inlet, which is that boat with the water, the reflections and edges at the same time, painting that water and reflections and those edges and stuff. And, and Jessica knows uh, how much I struggled on the front of that boat. Remember that? I was talking about that warm and that cool. I really wanted to make the front of that boat just pop. I could see it in my mind, but I couldn't make it pop as I, you know, I took a coffee break from filming and she and I are looking at it and I was just like, I need a tremendous amount of texture in the front of that boat. That's what's going to make it pop. It's got to optically pop with texture. And didn't I just, I went back yes. into that thing and I said, okay, people, hang on. Here, we're going to do, we're going to really pop this boat. And it worked. It textures, man, textures do so much. You know, it adds an extra zero to the end of your painting. That's what it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, adds that takes it up to that next level. But as acrylic painters, we could do it really easy because we can do it on a tacky surface or dry surface to get that texture in. And then we can push it back and uh, with a half tone. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to start thinking half tones and everything. You've got to let your paint tack up and dry up and paint that way. That's where you're going to get more life to your flowers, more beauty to your flowers and everything. And, you know, you've got to paint like, paint like a Schmidt and everything, but you can do it with acrylics. So, <laughs> and we can do that. You, yes, you can. We can do this. We can do this. It's a lot of fun. Yes, that's right. And your hands have got to look like this. <laughs> that's you know, a sign of a good day. That's a sign of a like good, that. that's a sign of a good day. But I'm going to um, upload this one, guys. I'm gonna, we're going to upload this. It's going to go into our videos direct. We'll set it up to upload tonight, so it'll be up later no, tonight. I've already promised Karen that it was going up tonight. So Okay, it's going up. It's going up absolutely tonight. And, yeah, we'll have it up there. I'll also put it up on our YouTube channel. But it'll be up in the, our videos direct. And um, I might even just put a link over on that answer videos because you guys might re you will really, really enjoy that. And... Uh, you know, just remember to change the side of your knife for for beach and water. No. <laughs> you'll do it. You'll do it. It's a heck of a lot of fun. I so enjoyed this painting, and I when I got done with this last night, I walked up the stairs and I was just like, man, I got to do this on a flower. I really, I really got to get this look right here into my flowers. And I'm not quite brave enough <laughs> on my flowers to do that yet. But I can't see how to do that in oils because it would stay wet for too long. And this is all, you know, acrylic. And it just, I just love the movement that's right in here of this water here. And when you watch me do this, I had this white bubbly stuff all here. And I just take my brush and I say, okay, I want to... Uh, I want to calm this down. I'm going to take one stroke. I'm going to make a blue, put a little green in it because I don't want the same tone. I want a different tone. This is the ocean. It changes. And I take my brush and I just pull it like this. And then I went back like that a little bit. And I said, wow, that looks really cool. <laughs> and then I made the tone just a little. I added a little beach color to the tone and struck it right there. And it makes it look like transparent water. It's an optical it's an optical thing, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. You don't paint trees. You paint the impression of trees. That's what you do. And it's a different way. And we're going to take this. We're going to take this uh, over to other things. But we really, we really got to do, we really got to understand that color. That's one of the things that I'm going to. And so one of the things that we're going to plan on with that color class is we're going to, um, like I said, I'm going to put in there a minimum, you know me. I mean, I said we were going to have 55 videos in the S104, and I think we're at 80 now or something like that. We have a, we've gone way overboard. 
but I said in the color I plan on at least 30 and I was thinking boy after I painted this landscape probably I mean this seascape it's probably going to be a little bit more than that because I'd like to do a monochromatic uh, seascape and landscape um, and then maybe a split complement uh, where you know you work like yellows and blue violets red violets warm cools and uh, that would be a split complement and try to get some of these other looks in there no blending pure acrylic and we can do some global and stuff like that but it's going to teach our eye to see tone and to do different things with that tone that's what we need to go that's where we need to go so if we're going to paint these half tones and do all this stuff and paint the pure joy of acrylic i got to get your eye to where you see color really really well it's gonna be a lot of fun and uh, jessica's you know just came off of her bachelor's of fine art with her uh, all that and she approaches color a little bit different than me she's got green hair but it, just a little <laughs> different <laughs> i have gray hair <laughs> she, she dyes her hair green for christmas it's really festive <laughs> it's lovely i love it it's lovely. <laughs> yes uh, but we have a lot of fun and we're gonna she's gonna show color this because we had this lovely discussion the other night which was great we every day of the morning we're at breakfast she and i and dave and she we we're talking about why red is at the top of the wheel and she knows why yellow is at the top of the wheel when that the history of that when that came in and why that came in and we're talking back and forth and dave is going we should have a camera on all of this what you guys are <laughs> we saying we were going so fast we were, we're so excited, excited we're just about it. it was just <laughs> like okay man you know now i understand it now as i studied more of the impressionism i can see where they go a little bit but i am so far left brain logical analytical it's hard for me but you know i gotta let it go i gotta borrow a little bit of betsy's uh, wd-40 to loosen <laughs> up a little bit more mm -hmm. we can <laughs> we can do that it's gonna be a lot of fun guys we're gonna do that we're gonna do some more live classes here we're gonna break some of these habits and show you some of these things it's gonna hurt a while it's gonna take some practice to do this deanne can tell you i mean it took three four days of me hounding them to get rid of that blending bit that they wanted to do with as they switched as I switched them over in Sydney as I switched them over from globals to acrylic and after they started painting acrylic now they do fantastic things in acrylic and they say the acrylics can really do it we got to get rid of that blending bit we can do blending and I can show you that but acrylics can do fantastic stuff all right and I know Jeff, Jeff, if you're still on or if you're there, I know you have a lot of questions and stuff like that. And you sent me that letter with them. We're going to answer them. We'll, we'll probably do more. We're going to do more live classes probably after the holidays. We'll give off because it's the 14th. Probably, we might do one more before the holidays. I don't know. I got to see. We have to get everybody's schedule together here because I need people to talk to me about how questions are answering and all that kind of stuff. Plus, I don't like sitting in here talking to myself. And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> It's a little lonely with that. And Kipper does it. Kipper's tired of painting with me sometimes. She's already gone to sleep. So <laughs> it, it's a lot it, It's a lot of fun to do all this stuff. And now that we're back here, I want to do some of those, answer some of those questions and, and push that. Anything that you need, any kind of question that you have, there's no stupid questions. There really aren't. And, you know, and if you have them, a lot of people have them, you know, and let's do some of these classes. Let's bring the S105 and the S104 classes in together because the S105 is pure acrylic class and the S104 is both. That's the Painted Simply class. S105. Yeah, that's the Painted Simply class. The and there's S105 a number of like, color um, discussion videos in that one as yes, well. Yes, there are. So if you're and just that new to color, that one's a I think it's 50, really 60 videos with. in that one that are just nothing but, uh, um, but they're all acrylic, some of the different acrylic techniques, and there's more. I don't show, I mean, you know, I could overdo your toolbox until you've practiced some of these. So there's more and there's more we're going to do. And so, um, you know, they're designed to teach you. These classes are designed to teach you techniques, not to go paint horse, to teach you how to do an acrylic or teach you how to paint these edges, to teach you how to paint the muscling on something. And because and that's going to make you paint flowers different. OK, that's where you're going to get those that interest and stuff. But it's going to take paintings, guys. It takes paintings. It takes takes a little bit of frustration we're all here for you you get frustrated or anything like that don't ever give up just drop us an email and we'll all cry together because we do that <laughs> you know, yes, we, do. we do I mean you know and Deanne I paint a long you know Deanne's in here Deanne and Margo you guys in there we've painted a long time together 
We've cried a lot together, figured stuff out together. We've drank wine late in the evening together, trying to figure out how to see something, you know, as we're trying to push it. And uh, we're, we're now looking at things a little bit different. I'm really excited about it. And Karen, you will be too as we go more in pasto. <laughs> you will be too. Yeah, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. Okay? Alrighty? Is that that kind of wrapped up? Did I kill anybody here tonight? I know. Everybody's really excited for more live classes and um, fixed painting. You guys just want to see if I make a mistake and can't edit it out, right? No. <laughs> we're talking about 30 minute challenge paintings. Oh, that's a great idea, yeah. too. And Serena just Because we do that. Yeah. Serena just logged in. Oh, Serena, you missed. Man, Serena, did you miss a whole bunch of stuff? Did you oversleep? <laughs> is Tommy in the classroom? Tommy is here. Yes. Hi, Tommy. She was supposed to be in the classroom. So, tonight. Serena's Serena, in... you're not in the class, and Tommy got up because it's. Uh, you're Serena's talking about working. Serena's working. Serena's she's with her, working. She's with her <laughs> students, and she's in Kaohsiung. Oh, and I want to oh, say okay. hello to everybody. Oh, so. okay. Oh, hello, oh, everybody oh, in Kaohsiung. Oh, hello, oh, Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan, yeah. <laughs> and Serena sends those. Every Everyone tell hearts. Serena that she missed an awesome live awesome class. Day. Awesome day. It was an <laughs> awesome live class. I can't believe it. Yeah. Hey Serena, I painted I painted this thing here with Ah, oh, you missed it. No. No. <laughs> no, this is a video. It's gonna go up, Serena. It's gonna go up in the art videos and uh, and we'll put it in YouTube and a few other places. But I used that scraper. No, you know how I killed everybody with the scraper there in Sydney. She was there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We painted the big painting like this, and it it came out kind of nice. Yeah, it came out kind of nice. So, anyway, okay, guys. So we'll look at uh, we'll get everybody up together. We'll get some more scheduling. I love the live classes too. I like having fun. I like it when you guys have those questions. So don't get frustrated. Hit that contact ping. Set set. Uh, Write those questions. Sometimes I'll answer you back. Sometimes I'll save them. We'll film it into the into the contact page. And Jeff, I have some of your questions here. We're going to start filming some of those answers and stuff here through the holidays. You'll see some of that because he gave me a whole list of just wonderful, uh, <laughs> wonderful stuff. I like that, you guys. You have a list. I start making a list and send me the list. And give them homework. We'll go through it. Yeah, give me homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. And if there's something that you have, it's like, oh, okay, well, how would you go about doing that? I like to figure that kind of stuff out. How do you go about doing this or doing that or something like that? I like to figure that kind of stuff out and stuff, so it's a lot of fun. All right? Okay? You guys all good? So Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, all kinds of really nice comments yeah. and hellos to Taiwan and a comment that yeah. Tama fell asleep, but I have no way of documenting she that. She says, thank you for a great live class. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Diane's thrilled to pieces. Awesome class. Yes. Yeah, Tommy, I, I am amazing. Remember that. I'm amazing, handsome teacher. <laughs> Betsy says, thank you so much. You're all right. Lots of Merry thank Christmas. Thank you, guys. Thank you very you. much. Well, Merry yeah, Christmas we'll let you to everybody. Know. Yep. Merry Christmas to everybody. We'll let you know when the uh, next live one. We'll maybe get one before Christmas, or it'll be right after the right holidays. Up. But we'll have quite a few of them. And we're going to we all set up in Sydney now to do live classes out there, too. So we'll have some fun out there as well. We'll take you out there. All right? Okay. We'll see you guys later. You take care. Good night. Good night.